Arts, and I'm a student at Talbot School of Theology. I'm working on a Master of Arts in Bible Exposition, and with that degree, I'm hoping to write Bible studies that present the material within the context of the Bible as a whole, um, and um, al that also, at the same time, foster spiritual growth. Um, I came to the topic of David and Bathsheba um, for three different, there were three things that sort of came together. The first thing was um, I've been concerned about the recent revelations of sexual abuse and its cover-up within um, the church and evangelicalism, um, particularly with um, Christian apologist Robbie Zacharias. The second thing is was a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Kenneth Bailey. Um, and he's known as an advocate for women, but he does not treat her well in that book. He is very speculative. And that was surprised me and just didn't sit right. The third thing is in my um, spiritual formation class uh, last semester, um, I have one semester at Talbot, uh, one year at Talbot, excuse me. Uh, we studied The Way of the Dragon and, or The Way of the Lamb by Goggin and Strobel, and they discussed the power imbalances in the church. And that was sort of like ring a bell as like the key to some of these problems I had been seeing in these other uh, areas. Um, and a lot of their approach focuses on choosing leaders of good character. Um, but when we're asked the question, um, why does sexual abuse keep happening? What, and why is it happening by people we thought were good? Why do we keep covering it up? Um, I think one of the answers to that is found in how we teach the applications of the story of David and Bathsheba. So this paper is called Vindicating Bathsheba, Correcting Interpretations of 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5 that ignore imbalances of power, protect sexual predators, and blame victims. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. 1 Samuel 2, 3. The American Evangelical Church is in an age of reckoning. Russell Moore described the recently revealed sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention, an apocalypse. In February 2021, I received a call from a friend. Robbie, she choked out. What, what are we supposed to do about Robbie? How did we get here? In recent years, some sources have explored the issues with powerful celebrity pastors who have abused and controlled others for their own fame and fortune. In hindsight, we can often see a lack of character in their lives. However, in light of the revelation of sexual abuse by leaders who, seemingly, acted as though they were truly devoted to the Lord, we must grapple with the reality that no one is immune from sin. The Bible tells us about a man after God's own heart who committed these same abuses of power, David. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5 says, Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Robah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Tragically, unfounded accusations have been lobbed at Bathsheba with devastating consequences. Though refusing the king was not a viable option, especially since her husband and all Israel had gone away, scholars, pastors, and popular resources have subjected her to all manner of speculation. There was no one to protect Bathsheba or come to her aid when David determined to take her. Yet, assertions blaming the victim proliferate, thus establishing social mores that allow predators to flourish. The speculation surrounding the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12 has contributed to a culture in the church where certain male leaders are given absolute power, while women are dehumanized and silenced. Contrarily, if we wish to create a culture within the church where women and men thrive as equals, 
we must actively promote an interpretation of the story of David and Bathsheba that affirms Bathsheba's innocence by acknowledging the imbalance of power between them. To remedy these problems, the first step is recognizing that Old Testament narrative must always be interpreted in light of the Torah. In any given story, the characters who followed the directives of the Torah were righteous, while characters who operated against the directions of the Torah were unrighteous. In 2 Samuel 11, 1-5, Bathsheba was the Torah following a bright player, while David succumbed to the allure of power. The purpose of this narrative is to describe David's sin and David's turning point. First and Second Samuel are one literary unit detailing the rise and fall of Saul and then of David. This affair is the critical turning point in David's story. Within 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12, the author utilized a chiastic structure to emphasize the key point. The thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was the one corrupted by power, taking advantage of the vulnerable, and using those close to him to cover it up. The actions in this narrative were driven by David. He saw Ra'ah, something that was good or beautiful, Tob, and he took it, Lachah. Second Samuel recapitulates Genesis 3. In the garden, the woman saw Ra'ah, something that was good or beautiful, Tob, and she took it, Lachah. David directly opposed Torah instruction by coveting his neighbor's wife and committing adultery. Continuing the recapitulation of Genesis 3, David attempted to cover and hide his sins. He called Uriah back from the war, hoping that Uriah would sleep with Bathsheba and obscure David's misdeed. However, Uriah refused. Escalating the attempts to hide his trespasses, David again scorned the law of God by committing murder. The Israelites had been warned that the king would take Lakah, the best tob of all they had. In 1 Samuel 8, Israel gathered and said to Samuel, Appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. The Lord instructed, Listen to the voice of the people. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. Thus, Samuel warned the people, The king will take your sons, take your daughters, take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves, Take a tenth of your seed. Take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys. Take a tenth of your flocks. And finally, you yourselves will become his servants. Even with this warning, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. David became the king who takes. Another significant action performed by David is that he sent Shalak others to do his bidding. He sent Joab and all Israel to fight his battle, contrary to what the people were hoping a king would do for them. He sent messengers to inquire about the woman, then sent them to bring Bathsheba to him. He sent to Joab to request that Uriah be sent to David, a request which was granted. When plots to manipulate Uriah proved unsuccessful, David sent a message to Joab, instructing that Uriah perish in battle. After Bathsheba mourned her husband, David sent for her to become his wife. David was the one with power and authority. The warning for 1 Samuel 8:17 was fulfilled. All Israel became his servants, obeying whatever they sent him to do. Not even Joab, the commander of the army, dared to defy David's suspect instructions. All the people were subject to their king, as Samuel had warned. The few actions Bathsheba performed, on the other hand, were Torah positive. First, she was bathing as part of religious exercise, a ritual cleansing. When David sent for her, she went with the messengers. After David took her, she purified herself from her uncleanness and returned to her house. When she discovered that she was pregnant, she sent word notifying David of the situation. Finally, after her husband died, she mourned for him. Her actions were in line with Torah instruction, and there is no indication that she intended or even consented to the affair with David. In 2 Samuel 11:2, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. His reasons for being in bed and then meandering to and fro on, the, on his roof at an unusual time of day in the evening remain a mystery to the modern reader. What we do know is that David saw a woman who was very ma'od, 
beautiful, good, the best, tov. This term is a description and does not indicate a flaunting of beauty. The tree in the garden was good, tov. Rebecca, like Bathsheba, was described as inherently very beautiful while she was carrying a jug to draw water. The description of one's beauty referred not to their sexual appeal, but to affirm that this was someone or something good. In our introduction to Bathsheba, we see one who is living as a righteous follower of Torah instruction. She was bleeding. In Leviticus, the Torah instructs that a woman continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and that everything on which she lies and sits shall be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Due to this directive, evening was a normal time for women to bathe from menstrual impurity. Additionally, ritual purification included washing clothes and bedding. This may have been done in private courtyards or publicly near the water source. Since communities in the ancient Near East were communal cultures, there is a possibility that women worked together to perform these duties. David may have observed a group of women bathing themselves and doing laundry. Whether or not she was in a group, Bathsheba was going about her monthly routine, faithfully following the law of the Torah. This adherence to Torah instruction illustrates her position as one who is righteous. Some sources, however, assert that Bathsheba bathed with the intent to seduce David. One scholar claims that she intentionally moved in next door to King David for the express purpose of exposing herself to him in a bid to improve her social status. That's King Bailey. Can you believe that? This speculatory reading neglects the importance of her familial credentials listed in 2 Samuel 11.3. Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Bathsheba was someone's daughter. Bathsheba was someone's wife. To our native English ears, Bathsheba sounds like a play on words that she was taking a bath. But bath or bat in Hebrew means daughter. The Hebrew says Bathsheba, bat Eliam, eset Uriah. Daughter, daughter, wife. It was significant for a woman's patronymic to be included. And the set of three familial names in a row emphasizes this fact. Her father, Eliam, and her husband, Uriah, were both part of David's mighty men. Eliam's father was Ahithophel, one of David's advisors. Furthermore, she was not only someone's daughter, she was the best of daughters. Bathsheba was an upstanding citizen who belonged to a significant family, and there is no indication that she resented spending her life with a lowly paid foreigner, or that she sought to improve her socioeconomic status. After inquiring about her, David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. David sent messengers, plural, and took her, masculine singular. Both of the verbs sent and took were performed by David. In the Hebrew, the term came to, feminine singular, was performed by Bathsheba. This verb can be euphemistic for intercourse, but it does not necessitate that interpretation. Since the text explicitly states in hule, masculine singular, the proper interpretation of she came in is that she literally walked with the messengers to the palace. It does not signify mutuality or consent to the intercourse. Messengers arrived with instructions from the king to go to the palace, and she complied. Interestingly, the Septuagint translates, she came to him as he went into her. Translators seek to convey the accurate meaning of an original text, and literal translations do not always properly convey meaning. It appears that the translators of the Septuagint understood the actions to be David's, and wanted to ensure that the readers understood that this was David's sin, and that Bathsheba was not a consenting independent agent. Moreover, the introduction to Psalm 51 indicates that it is a psalm of David after he had gone into Bathsheba. The psalm also specifies masculine singular action. There is no indication that Bathsheba moved sexually towards David. The focus is on David's exploits. He saw a woman who was beautiful, he sent for her, he took her, and he lay with her. 2 Samuel 11.4 continues, And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. Grammatically, the verb, she had purified herself, Ms. Kadashev, is in the Hithphile participle active feminine singular absolute. In the English language, all actions must be in the past, present, or future tense. Uh, the Hebrew language, on the other hand, does not have the same emphasis on when an action takes place. The participle indicates continuous action. Bathsheba was purifying herself continuously. The active feminine singular illustrates that this was an action performed by Bathsheba, not David. 
hits Viola is reflexive, so this was an action she performed on herself. An absolute phrase is a parenthetical explanation. However, due to the particular nuances of the Hebrew participle, there are no certain attestations of the absolute phrase in the Hebrew Bible. Thus, it is valid to translate this phrase parenthetically, referring back to verse 2 as the NIV. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Or to translate this phrase as the NASB, accomplishing a new action, and when she had purified herself from her uncleanness. The ambiguity of the grammar in Hebrew leaves the timing of the action open for interpretation. The Torah sheds light on why Bathsheba may have purified herself after intercourse. Leviticus 15, 18 says, If a man lies with a woman so that there is a seminal omission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Ever religious, Bathsheba followed Torah instruction to purify herself after copulation. Since this verb is in the participle and indicates continuous action, a likely interpretation is that she was purifying herself from uncleanness both at the beginning of the story and again after David took her. At no point in the narrative does it indicate that she stopped being purified. Finally, she returned to her house. She did not try to take a place in the palace, as suggested by some sources. When she discovered that she had conceived, she sent a message to David, I'm pregnant. It is a simple statement of fact. Some sources insist that she should have notified Uriah instead of David, but this suggestion ignores that Bathsheba likely did not have authority to send a message to the battlefront. It also fails to account for the cultural context. She was a Torah-observant woman in a Torah-observant community, and recognized that she would be killed if the king did not intervene and take responsibility for his actions. If a man is found sleeping with a married woman, then both of them shall die. Deuteronomy 22, 22. The Lord saw David's evil actions and sent Nathan with a parable about a rich man representing King David, a poor man representing Uriah the Hittite, and an evil man representing Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. One would expect David, the shepherd king, to fiercely protect the sheep entrusted to him. According to scholars, in the ancient Near East, the king was to protect the socially weak. Thus, his crime involved an abuse of power. Paradoxically, it was the Hittite, not the Israelite king, who was the good shepherd. The poor man, Uriah, nourished the one in his care. He brought her in and fed her from his own table and loved her as a daughter. This use of daughter, Bat, calls back to Bathsheba's name and familial credentials in 11.3. Illustrating Bathsheba as an ewe lamb, further proves her innocence since ewe lambs were used for sacrifices of purification and corroborates the premise that Bathsheba was continuously purified from uncleanness. Even after the adultery, she was referred to as a symbol of purity. She was referred to as a daughter. Bathsheba was not cast out of the community. She continuously belonged in and to her family. Bathsheba is referred to in later passages as the wife of Uriah rather than by her given name to emphasize this connection. Upon hearing Nathan's story, David, for the first time in this narrative, revealed a desire to follow Torah instructions, saying, he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. Nathan declared, you are the man. David realized that he had sinned against the Lord. Recorded in Psalm 51, David called upon the compassion of the Lord, requesting to be cleansed from his sin. David's life was spared, but his son died instead. The death of the infant was a consequence of David's sin, the child died instead of him. It was not a punishment or indictment of Bathsheba, as suggested by a notable Christian educator and pastor. Further, Nathan shared that the sword shall never depart from your house, and that the Lord would raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. As we're told, Absalom, David's son, conspired to usurp the throne and drove David out of Jerusalem. He appointed Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather, and David's former counselor as his own advisor. On Ahithophel's advice, Absalom pitched a tent on the roof, the very roof where David espied Bathsheba. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. David's sins could not be hidden from God, nor were his actions free from consequences. Jesus said, there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. Beginning in the garden, the sins of humanity have reverberated throughout history. 
Paul wrote, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. David's secret rape of Bathsheba directly led to the public rape of ten other women. Sin begets sin. All humans, no matter how devoted to the Lord they appear, continue to pridefully take what seems best, good, or beautiful to them, continually spreading death to others. A further outcome of this situation was that what man made low, the Lord lifted up. One of the themes of 1 and 2 Samuel is that the Lord exalts the poor and humble and brings low the rich and powerful. Bathsheba was lowly in mourning after the loss of her husband and infant. However, God exalted her by providing a son, Solomon, who would be included in the Messianic line. It was not through her own striving that she and her son became exalted. Rather, it was Nathan who initiated the conversation to ensure Solomon's kingship. Ultimately, God remembered her, cared for her, and redeemed the situation. The tale of David and Bathsheba reminds us of the sins of humanity reverberating, recapitulating throughout history. It reminds us that sin cannot be hidden from the Lord, and that he exalts the humble by redeeming what has been broken. Instead of emphasizing these points, however, we, American evangelicals, have weaponized this story to promote the virtue of woman's modesty. We have ignored the power dynamics at play, thus silencing victims of abuse by church leaders. We have exalted the powerful and further oppressed the weak. One popular author exhorts, for our safety, we women need to try to keep the men around us from temptation. 